Okay, uh, let's get started. Welcome to lecture five of the course about uh, stochastic market clearing and in general, stochastic programming and in detail scenario-based stochastic programming. So um, today and tomorrow, we will talk about the applications of stochastic programming in general and um, power, uh, power systems in electricity markets and in a broader perspective in energy systems. So uh, today, mostly we will talk about um, uh, scenario-based stochastic programming and tomorrow we'll talk about uh, different variants of stochastic programming and different methods for modeling um, uh, uncertainty, uh, including uh, robust optimization, uh, chance, uh, chance constraint programming, and uh, at the end, uh, distributionally robust uh, chance constraint programming. Uh, so, but today will be most about will be only about um, um, scenario-based stochastic programming, and we will use uh, electricity market clearing problem as um, our uh, basis. Uh, the, the problem that we will work on that, but you can easily extend uh, or implement uh, the stochastic programming to any different uh, problem if uh, you have uncertainty in your problem in your model. Uh, well, I don't know how many of you, uh, you already, excuse me, you already uh, worked uh, on stochastic programming and uh, scenario-based stochastic programming. Maybe by writing yes in the chat box, I can get uh, an idea how many of you already worked. Yeah, I'm getting uh, yes and no a lot. I think equally. Some saying yes, some saying no. Okay, so good. So I um, hope uh, for those who already worked on, on the stochastic programming, there is something new in this lecture. And for those who uh, uh, didn't work on, on the stochastic programming, uh, it will be a lecture that you can learn the basics. Well, let's see. Um, yeah, that's the uh, two books that uh, I recommend for uh, uncertainty modeling techniques applied to power systems, power and energy systems in general. Uh, uh, yeah, decision making under uncertainty in electricity markets and another book, integrating renewables in, in electricity markets. Uh, they are both very nice uh, books that you can read and learn a lot about how to model uh, uncertainty. Well, that's a figure uh, from Denmark. And uh, it shows the contribution of renewables, uh, wind and solar, in supplying total demand, total electricity demand in Denmark, the yearly demand. And as you see in 2019, sorry. Uh, and as you see in, uh, yeah, I have just a second. Just a second, I have an issue with the pen. Let's see, just a second. Yeah, sorry for the problem. So um, yeah, as I said, this is a figure from Denmark and as I see, see in, in 2019, almost 50% of uh, Danish uh, electricity load was supplied by mostly by wind and a little by, by solar. So, um, well, uh, we know that in electricity markets, we are trying to meet demand at the maximum social welfare, or if the demand is inelastic at the minimum total operational cost. But the issue is that when we add renewables to our power system or electricity market with a stochastic generation, we, we bring in uncertainty. Not only uncertainty, we are bringing variability and uncertainty. But the problem of uncertainty is that uh, we need to forecast. We need to, to forecast the, the uh, wind power production the next day, in the next uh, hour, in, in the next year, for in, in future, in either short or, or a long-term future, for different proposals, for operational pl uh, planning, for investment planning. But always the forecasting, our forecast could be inaccurate. And if our forecast is inaccurate, we, in, inaccurate, 
we may end up uh, in a, a wrong commitment and dispatch decisions. And at the, at the end of the day, we may end up in uh, increased total operational cost for the system or, or decreased social welfare for the system. So here, the quality of forecast is very important. It's very critical and uh, erroneous forecast may end up us in a decreased uh, social welfare for our electricity market. So what uh, we can do is uh, either first, I mean, different solutions. First, uh, let's say uh, the, the uh, one solution is that we always should add flexibility, the sources of flexibility to power system, uh, operational flexibility. For example, we, we should have enough um, uh, capacities of fast generators, storage, demand side resources. Uh, I don't know, uh, we have to integrate a power system to other energy carriers like gas, like heat. We should add um, control over uh, transmission lines like HVDCs to be able to uh, harness flexibility uh, and uh, that, that, we need, that we need them to cope with uh, uncertainty of uh, renewable power generation. Um, by flexibility, I mean the capability of an asset to be able to change um, its production level or consumption level in response to any change or any deviation in uh, wind or solar uh, power production, right? So we need to add uh, flexibility sources to our power system from different sources. Also, we need to think about the proper market design. Uh, if we have a perfect system with a massive amount of flexible sources, but if we don't have a proper market design, again, we may have problems. So at the same time that we are adding flexibility sources, we also need to think how do we need to upgrade our market model under uncertainty or not? And if so, how we can do that? Is it clear so far? Any questions so far? Is it clear everything? Good. Well, um, in general, uh, let me see, we have three. Yeah, all say is clear. Um, in general, let, let's, let's assume uh, for simplicity, a two stage settlement in one day horizon. Uh, let's uh, first assume, uh, a time stage that we will call it day ahead time stage where we can clear day ahead market. Uh, every day in most of electricity markets uh, all over the world, we clear a market that we call it day ahead, usually 24 to 36 hours before the real time. So for example, here in North Pool, we are clearing, at, I mean, in, in Europe mostly, and I think it's in the US is the case, we clear the day head market uh, at noon for tomorrow, for the all 24 hours of the tomorrow. So this is what we call a day ahead market. So in the day head time stage, uh, we need to have some forecast of load and wind or any other sources of renewable generation, solar, biomass or whatever, if it's uh, uncertain, we need to have some forecast of it. And then we clear day ahead market to, uh, to meet the demands uh, through uh, our old generators, which could be um, conventional generators and or uh, wind power or other renewables. So here the issue is that here we have a forecast of load and wind in the day ahead stage. And then in the real time stage, uh, it could be really real time or five minutes uh, before the real time, or it could be, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes before the real time. The time that we have uh, the actual realizations of the, of the load or wind or very accurate forecast of, of load and wind because we can go for very short term forecasting and we can get a very good uh, realization of what wind and load will be realized in the next 10 minutes or in the next, I don't know, 15 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever. I mean, different markets, we may have different time stage for real time. As I said, five minutes before the real time or 30 minutes or whatever, we need to clear a market that we call it real time market or balancing market. And here 
we know the actual realization of load, actual realization of wind power production. And then if we have any mismatch, any deviation of wind power production load with respect to, with respect to our forecast in day ahead, that's the real time stage there we can uh, uh, balance out our mismatches. We can cope with imbalances. Is it clear? So here, as you see, any deviation in demand will be supplied by any deviation from generation side. And of course, here I go for a very simple setup with only two stages, day ahead and real time. But in real world markets, we have more uh, uh, settlements uh, between day ahead and real time and even before day ahead market. For example, we have several, we may have several short run settlements like uh, intraday markets in different markets, in different uh, real world markets. So it means that our problem is more than two stage problem, but here just for simplicity, I go for uh, two stage uh, day ahead and real time. And throughout this lecture, I will use DA as an abbreviation for day ahead and RT as an abbreviation for real time. Clear? Any questions so far? Good. Nice, nice, nice. So let's start with uh, an example. Let's, uh, like our example in lecture one, let's assume it's not exactly the same. We have only one load and assume that our load is inelastic to price. It means that we are not gonna maximize social welfare, but just uh, minimize uh, the operational cost of the system. Uh, its demand is 120 megawatt. Curtailment cost is $80 per megawatt hour. It means that the, the inelastic load, it doesn't have any bid price. It's inelastic, but if we involuntarily curtail the load, we have to pay load a penalty, which is $80 per megawatt hour, okay? But in reality, this value is very higher in different markets. I don't know, it could be 1,000, 10,000 or something dollars per megawatt hour. But here, assume that it's 80. Also, we have uh, three types of uh, generators. One is uh, G1, is fully inflexible. It's 100 megawatt, it's capacity, uh, $10 per megawatt hour, it's a cheap generator but it's inflexible. What does it mean? It means that whatever, uh, I mean, we schedule this generator in the day ahead stage, but we cannot change its schedule in the real time. So whatever we schedule that generator in day ahead stage, it will be fixed. We can't, we can't change it in the real time stage. It's inflexible. You can assume, for example, it's a nuclear power plant or it's, it's coal uh, unit, which is fully inflexible. Then assume we have the second generator, which is fully flexible. Its capacity is 30. Its production cost is comparatively higher. It's $20 per megawatt hour, and it's fully flexible. It means that um, uh, we, we schedule that generator in day head, but in real time, we can, um, we can um, change its, its production level. And it's fully, it means that, I mean, if it's a zero in day head schedule, we can make it 30 in the real time or in, if in day had to be scheduled at 30 megawatt in the real time, we can make it zero. So it's fully flexible, right? Then assume we have a wind power uh, producer, its installed capacity is 30, its production cost is zero. In reality, it might be minus if uh, this uh, generator receives some subsidies or it could be positive if it, uh, I mean, this generator has some, I don't know, cost, maintenance cost or whatever. But here for simplicity, let's say it's zero. Um, we should have uh, a forecast in day ahead, but in the real time, it's real production will be 30. But the issue is that in, in day ahead, we don't know that it's, it's production will be 30. In day ahead, just we need to have some forecast. So in day ahead, we don't know how much it will be. It, it could be something between zero and 70. 70 is the install capacity. But in real time, it will be 30. It's something that to be realized in real time. In day ahead, we need just to have a forecast. Clear? Hope it's clear. 
Yes. Good. Let's see what we can have. Let's assume that in day ahead stage, we have a perfect forecast. So in day ahead, we could manage to perfectly forecast the production of wind farm in the real time stage will be 30. Just an assumption, right? The ideal situation. So if the forecast of wind at the day ahead is 30 and we don't have any transmission network, please tell me what would be the schedule of three generators we know that the load is inelastic. It should be fully supplied. It's 120 megawatt. So let me know what will be the schedule of three generators and the total production cost of the system. What would be the schedule of wind power based on our forecast? Yes, wind power will be scheduled at 30 because it's the cheapest generator. Yeah, Goran said exactly. G1 will be 90, so the rest of demand will be uh, provided, will be supplied by G1 because it's the cheapest generator. And by G2 will be zero because it's expensive generator. So our cost will be, yeah, wind power production cost is zero. So the production cost only comes from G1, whose production cost is $10 per megawatt hour. So 90 times 10, it's $900. Very good. Clear? So what about the real time, uh, uh, real time market outcomes? Do we have any deviation in the wind power production? No. So wind power production in real time is unchanged. So we forecasted it's 30 and in reality it's 30. So wind power production is unchanged. So G1 and G2, their schedule with respect to they had a schedule also is unchanged. So the cost of real time is just simply zero, right? Good. And what about the total production cost? The total operational cost in day ahead and real time. Cost in day ahead plus cost in real time. It will be just 900, very good. It's easy, right? But in reality, I mean, despite all great advances in forecasting methods, and, and my colleague Pierre Pinson at DTU is very expert in forecasting, uh, but it's still the wind power forecast and any type of other forecast, the load forecast, anything else, they can still be erroneous, right? So it means that in that stage, still we may have uh, imperfect wind forecast for, for wind. Uh, Nida asked, what if we have both solar and wind, which will be dispatched first? Again, uh, it's based on merit order. We will dispatch first a generator who comes with the lowest production uh, cost. If they are both come with a production cost of zero, they will be both dispatched first. If one of them, for example, let's say wind or, or, or solar comes with a negative bid price, minus two, minus three, it will be dispatched first. So it's based on merit order dispatch. Merit order dispatch means that we first dispatch the one who comes with the uh, lowest uh, offer price. Is it clear, Nida? Good, um, let's go for the next slide. Now let's assume that in day head stage, our wind forecast is 60. We know that in real time, the real production is 30, but we don't know it in the day ahead stage, right? So in the day ahead stage, we had um, a wrong dispatch, sorry, a wrong forecast. And by that means that our day ahead forecast is optimistic. And there will be later a wind power deficit of 30 megawatt in real time because we, our forecast is 60 but the true realization is, is 30, but we don't know that in the day at stage, okay? So 60 is our forecast, but it's wrong forecast. So let's see with a, such a wrong forecast, what will happen to our markets day ahead in real time. So can you help me first fill out the day ahead market outcomes? What would be the wind dispatch in day ahead stage? It's the cheapest one. Yes, Khadja, it would be 60. What about G1? 
Yes, G1 also will be 60, G2 will be zero, and cost day ahead, how much will it be? 600, exactly. Good, good. But now in real time, later in real time, we will realize, oh my God, we have a wind deficit of 30 megawatt, right? And we have to cope with that in, in the real time stage. So the job of real time market is to handle any imbalance. It could be power, wind power deficit or wind power excess. Here in this case, it's deficit. So here we have minus 30 for wind power uh, production. So what to do? How to cope with this minus 30? Okay, everyone's saying that G2. Yes, can we change G1? No, remember G1 is inflexible, right? So this will be unchanged, right? But for G2, what should we do? We should have plus 30 for G2. It means that G2, though it was not dispatched in day head, now it should produce 30 megawatt in real time. And we call it up regulation. So here G2 provides up regulation for us. Okay, good. Yeah, it's lucky for the system, yeah, that G2 exists. So let's assume that the production of G2 in day head and real time is the same. Though in reality, uh, the generators may, may uh, submit a higher offer price in real time with respect to the day head. But here, assume that still the production cost of G2 is 20. So how much will be our additional cost in the real time? Yes, 30 times 20, it's 600. And the total production cost is, yes, 1,200. Very good. Yes, exactly. As you said, 1,200, we have production deficit. So G2 was there and provided us um, upregulation services. Let's go for 70 now. So our wind forecast uh, in, in day head is, is worse. Uh, now it's not 60, it's 70. Now we will have later in real time a deficit of not 30, but 40, right? So what do you think, what will happen? Uh, Mant has asked, so wind power got paid if not produced. Okay, let me get back to the previous one. So here in each market, uh, yeah, very good. But let me first answer um, what um, Mant has said. So here wind producer will be paid 60 megawatt at the day head market price. But here the, the wind should be penalized based on the real time market price, which is not necessarily equal to day head market price. So here um, we will drive the real-time market price later and the wind producer should pay back 30 megawatt times the real-time market price, okay? Uh, yes, here let's go for 40. The problem here is that now it's, sorry, uh, not 40, 70. So now it's 70. They had market, wind schedule is 70, G1 is 50, G2 is still zero. The cost is 500, but here we have a deficit of minus 40. G1 is a steel unchanged because it's uh, inflexible, but G2's maximum capacity is 30 megawatt. G2 cannot produce plus 40. So steel G2 will produce plus 30. So it means that we will have load curtailment or load shedding of 10 megawatt. So here we have to pay G2 30 times 20, which is 600. And also we have to pay load shedding, load 10 megawatt times the load curtailment cost, which is 80 is 800. So 800 and 600 is 1,400. And at the end of the day, the system cost is 1,400 from real time, 500 from day ahead, it's 1,900. Is it clear? Yes, very good. Uh, yes, Goran said, what if forecast is lower than realization? That's exactly the next slide. Now let's say that our wind forecast in day head is 10. 
It means that later in real time, we will have a wind power excess of 20 megawatt. So what should we have? Let's go. In this case, if you agree with me, it's still in day ahead, wind producer will be dispatched first because it comes at zero price based on merit order. So it's 10. Then G1 will be dispatched fully 100. And then the remaining 10 of demand will be supplied by G2. So here the production cost is 1000 plus 200 is 1200 in the day. ahead. What about in real time? In the real time, we have plus 20 production excess from uh, wind side. G2 is unchanged because it's inflexible in our case. G2, see G2 only dispatched 10. The best G2 can do is just to produce minus 10, 10 of down regulation. G2 cannot reduce its production by minus 20 because it's scheduled in day head at 10. So we can provide minus 10 from G2. That's what we can do the best. So it means that now we can bring 10 megawatt of the wind producer in the system to the real, in the real time, um, in the real time stage, but the remaining 10, we will waste it. It will be spilled, right? It will be spilled. I'll, I'll explain, Goran, your question. So here, what we do, so here our production cost will be lowered by 10 times two, uh, 20, which is 200. So the production cost of the system will be produced by, uh, will be re reduced by 200. So our production cost total is 1,200 minus 200, it's 1,000. Okay, here we assume that uh, since wind production cost is zero, wind spillage is also, its cost is zero. But in different markets, you may assume, you may uh, penalize wind spillage just to support green production, right? So here we assume uh, wind spillage cost uh, is zero, but you can consider something for that. That's one question that I answered. The other one, should we pay G2? It depends. If you go for energy only scheme, energy only scheme, then no, G2 will not be paid in the real time. So G2 paid here, in day at, at the day had price, but in the real time, G2 should pay back $10 at real time market clearing price. So depending the difference of day had and real time prices, G2 may gain uh, some profit or, or, or not, right? But if we go other schemes that I'm not gonna talk here in this course is reserve and energy market. It means that then in day ahead, we also have another product calling reserve and then G2 will be paid in day ahead, not just because of producing energy, but also for providing reserve in the day ahead market. And then again, in the real time market, generator two should pay back. But with the difference that G2 also paid at the earlier price in day ahead for reserve provision. But here, as I said, I go for a simple energy only scheme. It means that G2 will be paid in day ahead, but should pay back in the real time, but based on the corresponding market clearing price. Let me sure uh, I covered all uh, questions. Raquel said that happens in real time. Yes, why not? Uh, always we may have wind access uh, in, in real time if our forecast is pessimistic in the day ahead stage. Uh, I mean, said, uh, uh, should we set a curtailment cost for wind generator? Yes, we can do. Here, I didn't assume. Raja said, in previous case, if wind producer has to return at real time market clearing price, can it happen that it has to return more than it's, it's received? Raja, we will talk about cost recovery in a stochastic setup soon. So I think I will answer it. Uh, Lorenzo said, what if we, uh, with pessimistic forecasting, there is no generator able to down regulation? Wind curtailment, yes, definitely, like here. Um, then Sebastian, realistically, G2 will not be down-regulated. His profit margin from day needs to be maintained. 
again, uh, I'm talking about energy only scheme. Later, I, I'll talk about cost recovery for generators under stochastic setup. Even we will talk if stochastic setup like this, is it realistic or not? We will talk about that. Uh, Sebastian said, uh, asked, uh, but uh, that's more of a legal issue than an optimization issue. I agree. Different markets may have different schemes to support generators. We will see. Uh, Giovanni said, who forecast the wind power, market operator or generators? What do you think? That's a good question. Who forecast the wind power? John Martinez says both. Raquel says market operator. Rafa said generators. Kai says market. Who? That's a good question. Who, uh, who provide the forecast? Amandine says both. Uh, Mauricio say both, Mahiar says both. Yes. Okay, let, let me answer. My understanding is that that's the wind, uh, the producer who provides a forecast, right? And bids to the market, not only the bid price, but also the quantity. So when you uh, offer to the market as a generator, it's a price quantity bid. So you offer your quantity and your, your offer price, your offer price, for example, it's a zero, your quantity offer is your forecast. But, but uh, for example, in California Kaizo market, also uh, the market operator, after the day had market, they have um, an aggregate forecast, the forecast of aggregate wind production, for example, in an area. And if the market operator realizes that well, there is a big inconsistency with the market operator forecast and the total individual forecasts, then uh, uh, the, the market operator should provide, can provide some incentives. There are some programs in Kaizo that I can provide information later to incentivize um, wind producers to increase or decrease their forecast, their quantity offers. Um, also, they, ha they, they have something called residual uh, unique commitment, which is the, the main, uh, the main uh, uh, purpose is this, for a market operator to make sure that the forecast is consistent uh, in the day stage. So different markets may have different, uh, let's say policies, but at the first place, the, the responsibility for forecast is for wind producers, solar producers themselves but then market operator can have some type of aggregate forecast to make sure, well, uh, the forecast, the total forecast is not very erroneous. Yes, uh, Sebastian asked, uh, is it also needed to, for estimating required reserve? Yes, definitely. Also in the day at the stage, the market operator needs to estimate uh, the, the, the amount of reserve, which is not, I, I, I will explain here. Is it clear everything so far? Good. So what we uh, saw so far is that with 30, uh, if our forecast is 30 in day head, we will end up to the minimum total production cost or operational cost for the system in day head and real time. Uh, with different forecasts, imperfect forecasts, we will end up to a higher total operational cost for the system. If we go for average forecast, like the average of 30, 60, 70, and 10, which is 42.5, then again, we will have some extra cost or higher cost uh, compared to perfect cost, right? The, the cost based on a perfect forecast. So the question is, remember in the day ahead stage, we don't know the perfect, the, the true realizations of wind power. Uh, production later in real time. What we have in day ahead is just a forecast, right? So the question is that what should we do? Should we go to with 30, 60, 70, 10 average forecast, any other value? What should we do? Uh, Priyanka says uh, average. Well, yeah. Yeah, we are, we, we are getting. Uh, uh, different answers, but the common answer is all of them. 
all of them using scenario. Yes, that's, that's exactly the point of this lecture. So isn't it smarter that we consider all those forecasts, each of them as a single scenario, we assign them a probability of weight and then determine that they had this, uh, dispatch according to all those potential scenarios. So it looks, it looks a smarter idea, right? So what does it mean it, here in this example, we had four forecasts, single point forecasts. Uh, yeah, uh, Nida says 90th percentile or maybe 99th percentile, yeah, okay. But let's, let's go for a simplest setup here. Let's say we have uh, four potential uh, single point forecasts. Let's say each of them is, is a scenario. See, we have scenario one, two, three, four. Then uh, the day ahead stage, at the day ahead stage, we have to schedule wind producer and two generators G1 and G2 based on all potential realizations in the real time, right? So it means that we can give uh, a weight or probability to, to be assigned to each, to each scenario. Let's assume that our scenarios, they have equal probabilities, right? It means that each of them, they have uh, 0 0.25 uh, uh, as, as, a, as a probability. And it means that in the day ahead stage, we uh, dispatch generators. Uh, our objective function still is minimized cost, but the cost in expectation while accounting for all four potential realizations in the real time. Is it clear? Very good. So we are getting uh, yes. Good. So it means that <clears throat> Very good. So this strategy, we call it look ahead strategy because in the ahead stage, we anticipate uh, for different scenarios in real time what may happen. And then back in the day ahead, we schedule accordingly. So because of that, we call it look ahead strategy. And if we clear our electricity market, it will be, we will call it stochastic market clearing mechanism. It means that we clear market at the day ahead stage, taking into account all potential scenarios in real time. So it's a stochastic market clearing mechanism. Clear? Yes. Good, just uh, for uh, recapping, in a deterministic market clearing, like what we had in lectures one, two, three, four, in the day ahead stage, we clear the market based on a single point forecast, deterministic forecast, like 60 megawatt. And then in real time, oh, we realized we, uh, we had imperfect forecast in day ahead, the true realization is 30. So uh, we, we, we uh, cope with the imbalance. Um, Rajan said, can, uh, I mean, the scenarios we said it's a 0.25 uh, can be different than that. Yes, of course. Uh, how we generate scenarios and how we uh, assign probabilities to them. It's a, it's a different topic that we can talk, but of course each scenario may have a different uh, probability than others. But Maybe the easiest way is that, I don't know, uh, you can uh, generate uh, 1 million scenarios based on historical data, based on if you have a probability function, which is in reality, we don't have the true probability function of wind producer. Let's say you have uh, 1 million uh, scenarios, but you know you can't plot all 1 million scenarios to your problem. What you can do, you can cluster. So you can cluster 1, 000, 1 million scenarios let's say in 100 scenarios. So based on the number of uh, samples that you put in each cluster, you can assign a probability. That's the simplest way, right? Then uh, the weight of each sample or I mean each cluster or each scenario might be different than others. But at the end of the day, as Priyanka said, the sum of probabilities for all scenarios should be equal to one. Brian, I'll talk about that.
uh, Brian said, how can the different stakeholders agree about the different scenarios? That's, I'll talk about it in, in the equilibrium part. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, yes, Nida said maybe we can use some Monte Carlo simulations. Yes, definitely. That's how we can uh, generate scenarios. Yes, of course. Yeah. I'm not here to explain how to generate scenarios, but yeah, we have uh, a very expensive uh, literature, how we can generate scenarios and how then we can reduce the number of scenarios. Clear? Good, uh, but in stochastic market uh, mechanism, in the day ahead, we don't have a single point forecast. We have a probabilistic forecast or a set of potential scenarios. So we dispatch our market uh, or clear the, the, our market based on a probabilistic forecast. And then in the real time, again, we, can, we, we have a true realization. So here, our uh, potential scenarios are 30, 60, 70, and 10. But in real time, the true realization might be 30, or it's not necessarily one of the scenarios. It could be 31. It could be 100. It means that all scenarios are really wrong or anything else, right? But the most important thing is that in that stage, we do our best to, to put all information we have in the day ahead stage market clearing problem. So uh, uh, Vasilios uh, said uh, cupulas or bootstraps or other type of simulation can also be used. I agree. Sahan said, aren't shorter time forecast errors considered in the real time market? No, here I didn't uh, consider, I don't know, uh, intraday market or any potential uh, forecast error of real time market if we clear it not exactly in the real time, but 30 minutes ahead of time. But here again, for simplicity, I assume just uh, we have perfect information in the real time market, just for simplicity, but you're right. Any questions so far? So if we uh, rewrite our market clearing problem as an optimization, not as an equilibrium, like as an optimization, uh, like uh, our model in lecture one. Uh, again, assume that, uh, we assume that the loads are inelastic. So we are minimizing the operational cost. If the loads are elastic, it's fine. Just we need to maximize social welfare. Uh, nothing will be changed uh, dramatically. So we are minimizing the total operational cost in the day at the stage plus total expected operational cost in the real time. So now we have two terms in the objective function and our constraints are again, production limits in both day ahead and real time stage, transmission network limits in day ahead and real time, load shedding limits. I'll tell about that what they are in the real time and nodal power balance uh, equalities in both day ahead and real time stages, right? So still we can clear a market in a stochastic way as a single optimization problem. Does it have an equivalent equilibrium problem like lecture two? We will talk later. So uh, the two relevant uh, references that you can go and read about the stochastic market, uh, it's, it's these two papers that you see in the screen. Um, yeah, so next slide, I'll talk about our example uh, and to, to clear it in a stochastic way, but maybe uh, we can go for a 10 minute break and then we can continue. Um, any, any question that I can take it, one, one single question? So there is no question. So right now it's a uh, five uh, five p.m. Uh, five five p.m. Denmark time. Let's have a ten minutes uh, break. Then uh, sharply five ten uh, we will continue. So see you in in ten minutes. Uh, thank you, John, for reminding. Now I'm uh, start recording. Uh, yes, uh, we can. We can continue uh, the uh, yeah the lecture. So uh, 
uh, let's let's uh, get back to our example. We have, yeah, as I said, uh, we have three generators, flexible, inflexible, and wind, and a load. So if we write the corresponding uh, stochastic market clearing problem, we will end up in uh, this type of problem, optimization problem. Let's see what it is. So again, we are minimizing uh, the total operational cost of the system in day and then real time, not maximizing social welfare because our demands are inelastic to price. Um, then I listed the variables under minimization operator. There are many. So the first three in the red box, uh, they are the day ahead schedule of the two two uh, generators and one wind power unit. Uh, so they are day ahead variables. Then um, uh, the next four variables, they dependent, uh, uh, they are indexed by scenarios, scenarios omega one, omega two, omega three, and omega four. It's the production, uh, not the production, the adjustment of generators G2 in the real time or scenarios one to four. Why we don't have it for gener generator one? Because it's fully inflexible. Uh, so this is adjustment variables. Uh, for example, when we say uh, we schedule G2 in day had 10 megawatt, and then in the real time under scenario one, we go for plus 10. So from 10, we go to 20. So plus 10, it's, it's a variable in real time. We call it adjustment variable, if you like. Then uh, the next four variables, they are load shedding variables of, of the load under four scenarios, W1 to W4. And the last four variables, they are wind spillage variables, again, under four scenarios, right? So here we have, uh, 12 scenario, sorry, 12 variables in real time and three variables in, in the day at the stage. Then uh, our optimization uh, has two parts. The first time the, the part, the red part is the total operational cost of the system in the day at the stage. It's uh, the operational cost of the generator G1 and operational cost of generator G2. We assume wind has zero wind power production cost. Then uh, in the real time, we gave the same probability to all uh, scenarios. They might be different for different scenarios. Here we assume they are, they have the same uh, probability, so 0 0.25. And uh, then what kind of costs we have? Our costs comes from yeah, under scenario one, uh, this is the extra production cost of generator G2. Remember, P G2 real time under that omega one, it could be positive or negative. If it's positive, it's up regulation. So we have additional cost to the system. But if it's minus, it means that that generator produces down regulation services. It, it provides down regulation services. So uh, the cost will be deducted um, because we are reducing the production level of G2. G G2. Um, then we have load shedding uh, cost. It's always a non-negative variable. And we assume that the load shedding cost of the load here, it's $80, $80 per megawatt hour. And we have the same terms for the next uh, three, three scenarios. Uh, Jemima asked, could you please go over why there are only three variables in the head and not more to consider different scenarios? So uh, we have, so this is our problem. It's in the real time stage and day ahead stage. In the day ahead stage, we like to know, we solve the problem in day ahead, but taking into account the potential um, scenarios in real time. So for the day ahead stage itself, we have three variables, um, the, the dispatch of generator one, dispatch of generator two, and dispatch of wind. And then 
for future, for the real time, we have uh, some, some variables per each scenario, right? But we solve this problem in the day head stage. So all of them, they are for to be sold in the day head and all the variables will be, uh, I mean, their optimal values will be uh, determined in the day head stage. Is it, is it clear, Jemima? So let's see what the constraints are. Uh, maybe you, yeah, the, the, the red box, it includes day ahead cost. They are not dependent on scenarios omega one to omega four. So they only include day ahead variables. Um, so the first one is uh, just the production limit of generator G1. It's between zero and 100. Then the production limits of generator G2 in day head, it's between zero and 30. 30, it's uh, install capacity of generator G2. Then the third constraint is the generation limit of uh, wind producer, it's between zero and 70. 70 is the installed capacity of wind. And eventually the last constraint, here we assume that we don't have network transmission system. So we have only one bus if you like. So the total production of three generators, it should be, it should fully supply demand. Demand is inelastic. So this is why we put 120 there and it's corresponding uh, dual variable is lambda day head. Is it clear? Yes. Good. So 70 is installed capacity of wind farm. So a discussion. Should we put it 70 or do you, because 70 is the installed capacity of wind, uh, but should we put it 70 or do you suggest any other alternative, something different than 70 as the upper bound for the day ahead dispatch of wind producer? Goran says the highest forecast. Hosna says the forecasted power of wind. Remember our forecast is Four, we have four uh, scenarios, uh, either 10 or 30 or 40 or 70, which one? Ingrid says the average forecast, or maybe you can say the expected forecast, right? Because they may have different probabilities. Raja says uh, optimistic forecast, which I guess it's the highest forecast. Yeah. Uh, it's up to you at the end of the day, which one uh, makes more sense. Um, either the highest forecast among the scenarios or the expected forecast or the installed capacity of wind farm. Um, th there's a paper uh, by my, uh, I mean, the first author is my, my friend, my colleague, uh, Juan Miguel Morales, uh, published at the European Journal of Operational Research, uh, explaining what the optimal value for the upper bound of wind dispatch in day ahead should be. But here for simplicity, let's go for 70, which is the installed capacity, but you can always change it based on your strategy. Akila says, I would use the capacity just because scenarios have inherently error. Yeah, that's that's Akila's idea. Yeah, so just, I, I, I like to raise a, a point that you can play with 70, it's, it's up to, let's say market operator or you, what, what it should be uh, the upper bound for day head wind power dispatch. Uh, let's now talk about um, the real time constraints. The, the constraints within the red box, it's the real time constraints only depend only for scenario uh, omega one. So as you see, uh, we only have uh, variables related to omega one in the red box. So we need to have similar constraints also for scenarios omega two to omega four. But I like that you uh, spent uh, like in the next minute uh, checking to interpret what those constraints are in the red box. And then maybe one of you can unmute and explain what each constraints, what uh, these constraints are in the red box to, to interpret them. Yeah, please check it out. And then one of you, you can, you can be volunteer.
Anyone would like to explain the constraints? Achilles, could you please unmute? Uh, yes. So, moment. Yeah. So, uh, the so what is the first constraint? So it's the what well, is the feasible region for the generator two? So what does it say? Does it say that uh, uh, both the day ahead and the real time uh, generation should be within the maximum capacity? Yeah, very good. The so the day ahead dispatch plus adjustment in the real time, their summation it should be still within zero and thirty. Very good. Uh, what is the second one? Uh, well, the, essentially, this is how much the uh, the generation can change only in within this scenario, only in real time. So, yeah. the maximum is that. Uh, 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 well, uh, from the pre uh, from the top uh, equation, we can actually derive the the lower. Yes. Yeah. So we assume that G2 is fully flexible, so we can change its adjustment in the real time as, as much as its capacity. So it's plus 30 and minus 30. Plus 30 is the maximum up regulation and minus 30 is the maximum down regulation that G2 can provide in, uh, in real time. Uh, what is the third? Well, this is for... Uh, uh... For scenario one, for the wind generator, the amount that we can uh, we can spill. Yes. And Why is it thirty? Which is bounded by the scenario generation at this point. Yeah, thirty is the generation. Uh, is yeah, the wind per, wind generation under scenario one. Yeah, yeah. So for scenario two, it will be uh, forty. For scenario three, it would be seventy. For scenario four, it would be ten. Very good. What is this constraint? Uh, this is the the maximum amount that we can uh, shed the, the load. Very good, very good. Yeah, that's a load shedding constraint. It's 120 because we can uh, curtail max the, the full demand, which is 120. Very good. And what is the last constraint? Okay, so this is uh, what the... Uh, couples, let's say the day ahead and the, the real time, it's uh, the, the, the balancing, uh, the balancing constraint. So the day ahead is the declared uh, energy mm -hmm. and uh, it's the first stage variable and all the other variables are the second stage variables that pertain to this exact, uh, to this exact uh, scenario. Okay. Can we say like this? This is the deviation of uh, uh, generator G2 in the real time with respect to its production in, in day ahead. This is the deviation of wind in real time with respect to its schedule in day ahead. And this is the deviation of load with, this, with respect to its schedule, which is 120 in, uh, in, in day ahead, right? We don't have G1 again because G1 is fully inflexible. There is no deviation for G1 in the real time. So uh, this is up or down regulation. It could be positive or ne negative. It shows how much G2 uh, will, will change. Its production will be changed in the real time with respect to day ahead. Do you agree? Um, and, yes. And the last term shows how much load um, uh, might be deviated be in real time. Scenario, yeah. Okay, what is the middle term? It's, it's deviation of wind in real time with respect to its schedule in day ahead. Why is it 30 minus P WP day ahead minus P spill? Why, why do we have it like that? Uh, okay, so 30 is the, the forecast for the scenario. 30 is the forecast of wind under scenario one. So we will realize it's producing 30, okay? Yes, it's the realization, let's say, of wind under this scenario. Yes. Uh -huh. The second variable, now it's the it's a first stage variable. So it's the amount of wind that is declared in the day ahead market. Right. It's common through all the scenarios. Yes. And the amount, the, the next yes. variable is how much wind is spilled yes. under this scenario. 
Very good. Even the offer from the day ahead. Very good. Let's say in day ahead, uh, we dispatch wind at 30, but uh, in real time, we realize it's gonna produce 20, not 20, let's say 30 or 40. And because of some reasons, we are gonna spill five. It means that our, our wind deviation in real time with respect to day ahead is 40 minus 30. So our deviation is 10, but we may have also wind spillage. So we are not gonna use the old wind power excess. So minus five, it's five. So we are gonna have five megawatt deviation of wind power in real time with respect to its schedule in day. So this is exactly this term. So uh, I see there are a few questions. Uh, Sahan said, isn't uh, the second equation in the red box redundant? Uh, yes, Sahan, why is it redundant? That's a good point. Sahan, would you like unmute? Uh, yeah, because uh, from the second uh, e constraint under subject two, and the first in the red box, we can derive the second equation in the red box. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so if you consider three of them together, one of them uh, is, is redundant, but, but it's good always to have them just to clarify, but, but I agree with you. Um, then uh, Nima said, do we need the second one? Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's the, second, the same question. Uh, Mahir asked, could you please explain the second constraint again? Yes, it says that how much uh, production of G2 can be changed in, uh, in real time with respect to, to, to the one in the day ahead. So it could be plus minus 30 in this case because it's fully flexible. Brian said the parameter 30 should be charged, changed for 60, 70 and 10 in the other scenarios. Yes, exactly. So let me go to the next slide. Yes, here, this 30 and this 30, they are, wind power production under scenario one. So in scenario two, it will be 40. In scenario three, it will be uh, 70. And in scenario four, both of them, they will be 10. Uh, Lisandros asked the, how the scenarios change if we consider 24 hour time horizon? Just a um, good question. Just you need to put index a T to all variables and also for uh, wind power productions, they are our uncertain parameters. So here, the 30, if it's wind through realization, now we need to index, put an index T. So uh, yeah, just you are making the problem larger, but it will not be fundamentally changed. Is it clear? Giovanni asked, are there incentives to build accurate forecast scenarios? Okay, we will talk about that. We will talk about it in the equilibrium problem. Uh, good. These two, they are linking constraints because here we have day ahead constraint, which is not dependent on any scenario or it's not indexed by any scenario and um, the uh, scenario one dependent variable. So this is a linking constraint and also this is the linking constraint. Good. Uh, then again, we can, uh, under uniform pricing, we can drive uh, prices uh, as dual variables of uh, day ahead uh, equality constraint and real time equality constraint. So here we will have uh, five uh, prices, one for a dual, uh, sorry, one for day ahead market and four for real-time markets, one per scenario, right? But here uh, for this, for lambda real-time, I said this dual variable is probability weighted real-time market price under scenario one. What does it mean probability weighted? Any, any clue? Any idea what does it mean probability weighted? Let's say we, you solve on GAMS or Python or whatever, and you saw that its value is $2. What does, ah, it's dollar, it's two. Yeah, the, the value of Lambda in real time, let's say you solve in Python and you got two. 
does it mean that the uh, the real time market price is two under scenario one? Uh, Direct said uh, zero point twenty five times eight. Nuran says, weight each scenario outcome by the probability and add up. Peter says, uh, okay, multiply lambda with its probability and sum. Hosna says, they had price plus two. I don't get it. Remember, uh, okay. Remember, what is the dual variable? It's the sensitivity of objective function with respect to any perturbation in that constraint, right? And here in your objective function, you already weighted your objective function with the probability 0 0.25, right? So it means that this probability is, is implicitly, uh, I mean, in, in so, so our, um, let's say like this, that our dual variable, lambda real time, implicitly includes 0 0.25 because it appeared in the objective function. So exactly as uh, uh, Carolina said, if our dual variable is two or whatever it is to drive real time price or to get rid of probability, we need to uh, uh, I mean, multi, I mean, uh, consider the fraction of lambda over zero point twenty five. Okay, so if it's two divided by this, it will be eight. So our our price, our real time price under scenario one, it will be eight dollars if the probability weighted uh, price is two. Is it clear? Yes. So the probability excluded, which is our price, will be eight. It's true. So I hope it's clear. Um, if we solve this um, problem in a, in a, in I don't know Gams or Python or Julia or whatever, taking into account also the constraints for scenarios two, three, and four. Uh, I already provided the GAMS code in the next slide and also I uploaded uh, on, on DTU inside portal. Uh, we will see that the day had market outcomes is uh, 80, 30, 10. The load is fully supplied and the corresponding operational cost in day ahead is 1,400 because uh, the production for G1, the cost is 80 times 10 for G2 is 30 times 20. So it's 1,400 and for wind, the production cost is zero. And as you see in this specific case, uh, the wind dispatch in day ahead is equal to our minimum forecast over scenarios. It was 30, 40, 70, and 10. And here the optimal day ahead dispatch is 10 in day ahead. It depends on our scenarios, on our system, on probabilities, and so on, okay? So if it's 10, it means that in all other uh, scenarios, we will have deficit or we will have excess. We will have excess, right? Because 10 is the minimum production over scenario. So if you solve it, uh, you will see that, uh, yeah, G1 is always unchanged in, in different scenarios because in real time it's fully inflexible. So uh, G2 always provide uh, down regulation while always we have wind excess and sometimes we have to have wind spillage because we don't have enough down regulation uh, sources. Uh, while in the last scenario, um, our forecast I mean, uh, I mean, uh, the wind production or wind dispatching data is exactly the same as uh, wind realization under scenario four. So all of them are unchanged. There is no curtail, uh, curtailed load because lo load curtailment is costly. We always try to avoid it. And uh, so each of them, they are operational cost in the real time. So if we go for total expected operational cost is the one in the day ahead, 
uh, and then weighted each scenario by one force. And then uh, we have four uh, costs in real time in different scenarios. So our total operational cost is $1,000. Is it clear? Very good. Nima uh, has a question. With this formulation, do we always dispatch wind at 70 in the day head? Uh, no, here the dispatch is 10. So here, as you see, the wind dispatch in day head, it's 10. It's not a parameter, it's a variable. It's a decision variable of your, the maximum. So, so we put P day ahead for wind between zero and 70. And here, what we achieved as the optimal value is 10. Is it clear, Nima? Uh, why won't we want it be 70? Because uh, wind power is zero, right? The cost of it is zero. So I'm talking about the quantity. Yes, then why don't we clear all of it? The cost uh, is zero. The cost is, yeah, but that, that's the point. We are not clearing the market deterministically. We clear the market stochastically. So in the day ahead, you clear the market based on all the potential scenarios in real time. So this is the look ahead strategy. So though wind production cost is zero, so realize that, ah, oh, in day ahead, it's better to go for 10. And then in the real time, we will try to uh, settle down the wind power excesses that we may have in different scenarios, right? Hope it's clear. Adam says, is, the unique, uh, is this a unique solution? In terms of uh, $1,000, yes, it's unique, but you may have different uh, solutions. So uh, you, you have to check it out. For example, this could be, I don't know, maybe 11. And then here you have plus, I don't know, 19, plus 29, plus 29. And then for uh, G2, it will be minus 19, minus 29. And then you may get the same solution. But in terms of the, uh, the optimal value of the objective function, it's unique, it's $1,000. Uh, Daniel asked, could VP in day had returned a result different than of the four values considered in, the yes, definitely. VP in day had dispatch, I mean, they had dispatch of VP, it might be 15, it might be 16, whatever. It's the optimal value that we have to determine. Goran asked, the problem with bidding 70 for VP in day ahead is that you can have a lot of load curtailment when the real time wind power is less than 40. Yeah, I mean, you have to think what is the optimal value. At the end of the day for this problem, it's a parameter, but you have to think what is the best strategy to to put upper bound for day head wind dispatch. 70 average, minimum, maximum production over scenarios. Yeah, that's something that we have to think. And as I said, there is a paper discussing about that. Yep, is it clear? Good, this is the uh, GAMS code for stochastic market clearing problem that you can find it, sorry, that you can find it uh, on uh, DTU Insight. So uh, let's talk a, a little about exercises for tomorrow. Um, so in here in our table, I didn't report day ahead market price, lambda day ahead as a dual variable of power balance quality in day ahead and the four real time market prices, lambda real time. So I would like that you think, uh, maybe you, you can run the GAMS code or you can write a, a code in Python or Julia and drive the prices and then please try to interpret them. For example, you will end up maybe, I guess, the day head price is 10. Why it should be 10? Why is it 10? 
or how, how can we justify it, right? Then I don't know, maybe here it could be something, I don't know, for example, 20 or whatever, not they had the real time under scenario one. So I like that you think, you, you derive those prices and think how to interpret those prices, okay? How by, remember, uh, uh, increasing and decreasing uh, demand by 0 0.01 megawatt or something like that, just to analytically uh, or numerically, not analytically, numerically derive the sensitivities. So I would like that you drive the prices and think about them, why those prices achieved. So that's the uh, first exercise, uh, obtain prices and try to interpret them. Um, then the second exercise, there is a question. Matty asked, should we always expect that uncertainty reduce the social welfare? Uh, with respect to what? That, that's the question. Reduce with respect to what? It, it depends on the, in the deterministic forecast. What is the deterministic forecast? Are you talking about deterministic forecast with perfect forecast with 30? Yes, definitely social welfare reduced. But are you comparing uh, with deterministic market with a very wrong forecast, then perhaps no, the, uh, the stochastic uh, design provides a better social welfare. So it depends on your forecast in deterministic setup. Uh, Nida asked, can a renewable have dual entries in the table based on forecast, for example, max probability of wind production 30 and minimum probability 10 megawatt? In this case, if two entries from wind farm 20 and minus 10. Nida, would you like to unmute and uh, a bit uh, clarify your question? Hello. Hello. Yeah, so I mean to say that if, uh, if the wind power plant can gain from the curtailment, if they uh, forecast it beforehand and leave a headroom of 10 megawatts. Uh, so why wind should take benefit from uh, load curtailment? It depends on the market price, if it's profitable. Okay, what you are saying is you're talking about a strategic uh, bidding that we try to interpret, uh, or sorry, we try to bid in a way that we maximize our profit by manipulating the prices. Uh, if you're talking about that, it's a strategic behavior. It may happen. We can talk about it in the bilevel program. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. But so far, I assume that everyone trusts fully offer their true bits and quantities based on their forecast. Hosna asked uh, if the market operator should clear they had in real time in different time horizon, then why we should solve their optimization problems together. I mean, without, why not clearing real time and day ahead separate? Uh, Hosna, we are clearing day ahead and real time markets separately. Let me get back to, to one of the slides. I explained that. Um, yes, here. Please note that still we have day ahead market to be cleared let's say 20 hours ahead, uh, ahead of time. And still we need to clear real time market in real time. So nothing changed. What I'm saying is that in the day ahead stage, maybe instead of deterministic forecast, you can have also a probabilistic forecast, a set of scenarios, because you are not sure about which scenario will be realized. And then you can think, okay, if I do this in day ahead, that will may happen later in real time. So with a look ahead strategy, maybe you can uh, make more informed decisions in the day ahead stage. So I'm not saying that we don't need real time market anymore. Just I'm saying that in day ahead stage, let's clear market a bit more in a more elegant way and see what our decision at the current moment at the day ahead how it may affect our decisions later in real time, right? 
So you, you have a bit, a look ahead strategy. So I, I hope it's clear. So I'm not saying that we will not need real time market anymore. No, just in day ahead, we do a bit a better job and see how our decisions may impact our dispatch later in real time. Uh, Mehdi, I'll, I'll talk about if we have stochastic market in North Pool or other markets. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it, just please be patient. Um, Brian asked, uh, why can we have different solutions for the variables, but the same objective function in the stochastic market clearing problem? Again, Brian, I, I, I gave you as a simple example. Let's say we have two generators, exactly the same cost. Uh, so we can dispatch them 50, 50 or 70, 30, whatever it is, but the value of objective function is the same because their production cost is the same. So always it may happen that we may have different schedules if it doesn't change um, the, the value of the objective function. So what is unique is the value of objective function. If you like to get a unique solution, not only in terms of objective function, but also in terms of variables, you need to have th those variables appear in the objective function in a quadratic way. Is it clear? Good. So let me get back to exercise number two. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So what we uh, did so far, we, uh, we had a formulation for a, the simple case study with four scenarios and yeah. But here I would like that you generalize your market clearing optimization problem. You had one in lecture one. I, I like that you generalize it for a stochastic setup, right? You, I mean, you, you upgrade it for a stochastic setup and write a generic optimization problem for market clearing. So hopefully one of you, you will do it uh, for tomorrow and you will share your screen tomorrow in the exercise session. Uh, then uh, please, uh, again, uh, drive uh, the KKT conditions of the generic formulation. And I like that you, okay. And for the first step, uh, you can also check your formulation with the one in this paper, if you like. But based on the KKT conditions, it's simple. Try to think under which conditions you will see that the day ahead price at each node is equal to expected real time price. So it's a real time price, right? And the real time price is divided by scenario omega, but here also you have scenario omega, they will cancel out. So you will see that the lambda day ahead is equal to lambda real time, uh, sorry. Lambda real time, it's expected value. So I would like to, to, to that you think under which conditions we will have day ahead price at each bus equal to expected real time price. And you can easily find it out using KKT conditions. Is it clear? Hope it's clear. Good. Um, in lecture two, we saw that uh, our optimization problem for market clearing has an uh, equivalent equilibrium problem. If we assume that uh, everyone, there is no externality and everyone uh, bids and offers trust fully, right? We have the same story in the stochastic market. So you can easily see that uh, our uh, stochastic market clearing problem as an optimization is equivalent to this equilibrium problem under which uh, each generator maximize its expected profit. The same wind generators, they maximize their expected profit. Transmission operator maximize uh, its uh, expected profit, which is expected congestion rent. Here, uh, yeah, in this example, we assume that demands are inelastic, so they are not maximized utility. But here, since we may have load shedding, they are minimizing their expected cost incurred by load shedding. 
And then uh, two different price setters, they set uh, prices a day ahead and at real time for each scenario separately. So if you drive this type of uh, equilibrium problem and drive the KKTs, you will see that uh, those KKTs are identical to those of <clears throat> stochastic optimization problem. So again, it means that still in the stochastic setup, uh, uh, the market is efficient and no one will deviate unilaterally from uh, market clearing outcomes. Again, under the assumption of perfect competition. It means that everyone offers and bids at the true uh, bid prices. I mean, at true costs and utilities and forecasts. Is it clear? Very good. Yeah, exercise three. It's for you, Nima. You, you asked this question. So this is you. Hopefully you will answer it tomorrow, Nima. Uh, it was Nima, right? No, it's, it was Mehdi, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, though the stochastic market clearing as an optimization or equilibrium, uh, <laughs> Yeah, Nima says, yeah, it's mighty. Uh, though stochastic market clearing in day ahead, it looks elegant, right? We have a look ahead strategy, but, and, and also we have several stochastic models designed in the literature. And the simplest one I, I just presented in this lecture, but they, all of them, as far as I know, they are just uh, theoretical models. And to the best of my knowledge, there's only and only one market, which is a Swiss reserve market uh, in, in Switzerland that you they use a stochastic setup. And, and you can read this reference about uh, how uh, stochastic programming, uh, scenario-based stochastic programming is being used in, uh, in, in the real world. But other markets, either in Europe or US or China or Australia or I mean anywhere else, uh, to the best of my knowledge, they're all still using a deterministic setup. It means that in the day head setup, there's a single value forecast for wind, for load, for solar, for any other potential um, uncertain parameter. And then uh, they go for a deterministic market setup. So the question is why, what is wrong with stochastic market design. Is there any shortcoming for stochastic market design that no one in real life, they, they wouldn't like to use it? What's, what's going on? So I like that you think about the potential shortcomings of stochastic setup, uh, the practical problems, and also uh, the problems by design, right? And here I have a few guides here that you can read it. Right. And before going to the next part of exercise, do you have any clue at the moment why implementation of a stochastic market clearing could be challenging in, in the real world? What do you mean, Mehdi? Maybe you can explain. Uh, yeah, um, I think it seems that um, since um, the the loads and generations they need to 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 uh, support their bids by the stochastical data, then clearing the market becomes heavy for the market operator. It seems to me like that. I agree with you that computational issues is the one problem. Uh, I I'm, I'm with you. I agree. If, you, if instead of four scenarios, you go for four million scenarios or four billion scenarios, we may have problems. So, so we have increased uh, computational issue, I, I agree. Um, then uh, I see a few others. Uh, yeah, Lorenzo, Lina, Nima, they are all talking about agreement about of scenarios. That's totally correct. At the end of the day, optimization uh, problem is equivalent to equilibrium. And here everyone tries to maximize their profit in expectation. It means that 
all of them, they should have agreed on a bunch of scenarios. Uh, it's really hard to make sure that the people, they have agreement on, on scenarios, not only on the amounts of wind production, also about the probabilities. It's, it's really hard to make sure that, uh, yeah, they, they all agree about, about scenarios. I, I agree. So uh, also Libai said consistency of each scenario. I think she's referring to the same thing. A classic electricity is a highly risk hours industry. People prefer having much larger deterministic reserves. That's true. I can reward your answer in a way that uh, it, it, it yeah, compromises the transparency of the market clearing. So people, they might not know what's going on. So yeah, it complicates the market design, I, I agree. Giovanni says multiple optimal solutions. Uh, well, it, all, it may also happen in deterministic. So it's not a unique problem that we, we have in the stochastic setup. So multiple optimal solutions, I don't see it as a specific problem just for stochastic model. It, it may also happen in deterministic. San said, should the market participants have the same forecast? Yeah, I, I, I said. Stochastic market clearing simply says that the people, they have the same understanding, the same beliefs about scenarios and their probabilities. So definitely this is a shortcoming, one shortcoming for, for stochastic market design. Uh, the, the, the Nuran, I think she's saying something similar. Okay, what you said so far, all of them, they are practical problems. Computational issue, agreement on scenarios, blah, blah, blah. But what about the shortcomings of stochastic market design, market problem by design? Are we losing any market property? So that's what I like that you think about it uh, by tomorrow. And please read uh, the guide. But the second part of the exercise is, okay, if no one uses stochastic, on the, on the other hand, the deterministic setup, it might be very earnest, right? Uh, the, the forecast might be so bad. So, so by in integrating more and more renewables with uncertain production, how we can improve the performance of deterministic market uh, clearing problem? And what do I mean by improving how we can get solutions, how we can get solutions from the deterministic model as close as to those in, in the stochastic model while not defining scenarios, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so maybe you can think, you can explore in different markets in US, in Europe, by, by integrating more renewables, what they are doing, what type of, I mean, new products, new regulations, new policies, they are adding to their deterministic model to improve the performance of the deterministic model. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, Estiel asked sample average approximations. Uh, oh, I'm not sure, yeah, but for scenario generation, always we can use sample average approximation. Um, yeah. Yeah, with sample average approximation, maybe uh, you, you, can, you can see if the performance of the terminist mo model is good or not. But my question is a bit beyond than that. How to improve its performance? Not to evaluate if the performance is good or not, how to improve it, right? So Nida asked, uh, would there be unfair cost to some participants? Okay, that's something that you have to think, Nida. Please, please think of that. What's wrong with stochastic market cleaning uh, by design? Uh, let me finish in uh, five, six minutes. Um, so remember we had step two uh, that you have to work on. And there are two options for step two. One, option one is scenario-based stochastic programming. Option two is based on robust uh, distribution of robust uh, programming that we will talk tomorrow. Uh, so please read option one and the steps. Is everything, every terminology there clear to you?
Is there any terminology which is not clear? Yeah, Jemima said, what do you mean by out of sample analysis? Uh, it's exactly my next slide. Except for out of sample analysis, do we have any other term which is not clear? Drake asked, do we have any variable number constraint? Uh, again, I would say 1000, but uh, you already have 1000 in step one, just uh, at some scenarios, um, again, still it will be more than 1000. So if your uh, step one problem is already large enough, then it means that the step two, step two will be also large enough. So, yeah. Nicholas said, what if there is more than one uncertain parameter? If there is more than one uncertain parameter, let's say we have two wind producers, wind producer one, wind producers two. For wind producer one, there are two samples or two scenarios. For wind producer two, there are three scenarios. It means that in general, we have six scenarios, right? If we assume that all of them, they may happen. But always there might be some uh, tempo special uh, correlations. It means that uh, some of the six scenarios may never happen. Uh, so then again, it's about scenario generation, how we can generate scenarios accounting for potential correlations, right? But how to derive scenarios or oh, blah, blah, it's, it's, it's outside the content of this course. For, for this course, just you need to take into account some scenarios and uh, yeah, plug into their model, to your model. Yes, definitely for scenarios, you need to assign some scenarios. Uh, it could be, you, simply you can assume that they are a Q probable. But the question again, except for out of sample analysis, is everything clear to you? Okay, Raquel, okay, now, let me explain. Then I'll get back to this uh, slide. If still there's any question, I'll, I'll explain. So what uh, is an out of sample analysis? Let me explain what it is. Let's say that with any technique, you generate, for example, 1000 scenarios. So you have a data set, uh, including 1000 scenarios. How you can generate those scenarios? For example, uh, very simple, but not very uh, accurate. You can say your wind uh, power production, it follows a uniform distribution. Then you can uh, pick, I don't know, randomly pick 1000 points over your uniform distribution or using Monte Carlo simulation or using historical data, right? So whatever you use, you, you can, for example, uh, uh, generate 1000 scenarios, okay? Then you can split your scenarios 1000 to two data sets. I call it in sample, in sample scenarios. For example, it could be, for example, 50 scenarios. So you pick 50 scenarios out of 1000, either you select the best, most, sorry, the most representative scenarios. For example, you can use um, clustering techniques like k-mean, you can easily use uh, k-mean uh, function in MATLAB, saying that from 1000 scenario, pick me the best, the most representative 50, right? Or 60, I'll, I'll talk about those numbers, y50, y60 later. So then uh, the remaining 950 scenarios, there will be in here that we call it uh, testing data set. So 950, they are our testing data set. And the 50, you can call it in sample scenario, or you can call it training, training data set. Is it clear so far? Aklas uh, said, for anyone familiar with machine learning, out of sample analysis, it's equivalent to train tested. Exactly. Training and testing, uh, testing they are terminologies from machine learning. Um, good. 
So what should we do? Let's say like this, uh, you have your stochastic optimization. Stochastic optimization. So in your problem, if you remember, it's minimizing the cost, right? It's minimizing the cost, depending on day ahead variables and real time variables, which are scenario dependent. So X day ahead is production dispatch of generators and uh, wind producers. And one real time with index omega, they represent uh, the load shedding, wind displaced, and generation adjustment of, of generators. So our variables are X day ahead and one uh, Y real time uh, for, for scenario omega. Is it clear? Then you have uh, constraints like, uh, let's say the linking constraints. Uh, yeah, you can say H of X day ahead. Y real time omega is lower than or equal to zero. And G X day ahead, Y omega real time equal to zero. Do you agree that we can write our stochastic optimization problem like this? Clear? Okay. So what we are gonna do, we use these 50 scenarios to solve our stochastic problem. So the 50 scenarios as our in sample scenarios or test, uh, sorry, uh, training scenarios, we will use them to solve our original problem, right? And the outcomes of this problem will be X day ahead star, star means the optimal values and Y real time omega star. Is it clear so far? Is it clear so far? Yes. Okay. But the problem is that X day ahead and Y real time and also our value for cost, it depends on the 50 scenarios we picked. Why 50? Why not 60? Why not 900? And how to know that those 50, they are the best scenarios we picked, right? We don't know. So now we need to test our model and to evaluate the quality of the 50 scenarios we, we already picked. So this is why we need testing data set. Clear? So any idea, maybe one of you can unmute how we can test the, the quality of the 50 scenarios we picked or how, how we can know that this, this values are good enough. How we can use those 950 scenarios that we haven't used yet. Yeah, Nuran said we can, we can test by using nine. Okay, so what we can do just to save time, we can now build another optimization problem just in real time, only in real time. We assume that we fixed X day ahead. Now we are in the real time for fixed day ahead decisions. Exactly. For fixed day ahead decisions, we just solve our problem in the real time, in the real time stage. So we will have a problem of minimizing just Y omega real time. I call it Y prime to differentiate it with the Y in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the red box, right? So again, is the cost just as a function of uh, Y prime. Clear? Subject to, again, the same variables, but remember X day ahead star, it's fixed. This is fixed, right? And Y prime real time omega is lower than or equal to zero. And also the other constraint. Is it clear? So for fixed day had decisions, 
but for which scenarios? For in-sample scenarios. So maybe instead of omega, also I can write omega prime because we are using here the testing data set. So here in the green one, you are getting the fixed values for day head decisions from the red box while we are solving the real time problem separately for each testing data set. Is it clear? Very good. And the outcome here will be Y prime real time omega prime. Right? So we use in sample, we use in sample or uh, training data set to get the optimal value of X. And then to get the optimal values of Y, we use Y prime, we use the testing data set. So my question is the green box, the green optimization, is it uh, stochastic or deterministic? It's for 950 scenarios. Yes, it's deterministic. So we need to solve this problem 950 times separately. While the red box, it's a stochastic problem. Do you agree? Very good. So let me, uh, so what can we do now? You can, uh, you can go with uh, 50 scenarios, then with 950, you check uh, the cost and then you can compare in sample and out of sample cost, how close they are. I will explain what in sample and out of sample cost are. If you realize, well, they are very uh, different, then you, it means that either 50 is not a good number. They are not representative enough of the original 1000 scenarios. So it means that you have to either pick better 50 or 50 is not enough. You have to go to 60, you have to go to 70, you have to go to 80, whatever. So you have to repeat this until you make sure that your in-sample scenarios are representative enough for the original data set of 1000 scenarios. Let me just uh, erase this part. So, so now let me know in sample cost. What is the in sample cost? In sample cost is exactly the what we achieved here. Right? Red box gives us the in sample cost. What is the out of sample cost? Yeah, uh, Hosna says green box, but here we have only the cost in real time. And also we have only for one scenario, how to add the day head. Yes, Akila says the distribution of results of green cases, I totally agree. And also we need to add day head cost, which day head cost? The one comes from the, yeah, the fixed cost, exactly. So, so the out of sample cost is our cost from here, but just the day head part, just the day head part of our cost from the red part, plus the average of this cost. So if we have 950 times uh, 950 scenarios, so uh, the omega prime from one to 950, our cost here, cost in the real time. Y prime, real time, prime, omega prime. Yeah, is it clear? It's the average real time cost achieved from, from the green part. Good, so that's out of sample cost. So you need to uh, compare your in sample and out of sample cost not only in terms of expectation, but also in terms of, for example, standard deviation or percentile or, or whatever, and make sure that 
your uh, 50 scenarios for in sample analysis was good enough. If not, if in sample and out of sample costs, they are really different, then it means that uh, those 50, they are not good enough. Either you need to, to pick better scenarios from the original 1000 scenarios, or you need to increase uh, the number of scenarios in as uh, for, for training your, your problem. Yeah. Uh, what can be the error threshold? Uh, Priyanka, it's up to you. As much as they are getting closer, it's nicer, right? There, um, I don't know what's the best. The best is zero. Uh, <laughs> Nima said, do you have any suggestion for how to recalibrate the selection of the training data set? Uh, maybe you can explain how, what do you mean exactly? Uh, so, I mean, uh, if our um, error is quite high, then is it anal analytically that we should choose uh, another? Training? If the difference of in-sample and after sample is really high, it means that uh, you have to do something with the in-sample scenarios, right? So either select those scenarios in a more elegant way. Mm -hmm. If you picked randomly, then it means that you have to do a better job or just increase the number of scenarios. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, one other way, you pick 50, you can uh, select 50 in different tries, uh, 50 in the first try, the other 50 in the second try, the other 50, the other try, and then you uh, achieve out of sample uh, cost, and then uh, consider the average out of sample cost with difference 50. Then it would be even a better a better cost for your system, right? Uh, if I'm not wrong, it, it goes towards cross-validation in, in, in uh, machine learning. Uh, yeah, kind of uh, K-fold cross-validation. Exactly, exactly, uh, Mauricio. Very good. So if we get back to, sorry. Yeah, step two just the last minute. And then in one minute, we will go. Uh, is not everything clear what you should do in step two? Maybe you can read it again. Any any confusing term in this slide? Yes, uh, Nuran asked, does cost refer to the objective function value? Uh, yes, yes, we assume the load is inelastic. So yeah, I'm talking about the total operational cost of the system by cost. Good, good. Uh, so I would like to conclude uh, this session. It's uh, yeah, way longer than what we scheduled. Sorry for that. Um, so uh, yeah, we can, we can conclude. Uh, I'll be here after five minutes. I need a five minutes of break. If someone has any question, but private question, let's say some, some questions then you are welcome to, to ask. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be there after five minutes to, to, to answer your questions about the projects. Uh, Iannis said the value of objective function, are we going to talk about the value of the stochastic solution versus the expected value of perfect information? You can do that uh, if, if you like, if you have knowledge about that. But for me, no, just compare uh, the cost by cost, as I said, the total operational cost of the system in, in sample and out of sample analysis. That's it, just, I, I see that you are comparing those costs, not in terms of in, in expectation, but also in standard deviation. Good. So yeah, see you in five minutes to those who may like to answer. I mean, you like to ask a question, sorry, but uh, if you don't have any questions, then uh, see you tomorrow in the exercise session. See you, ciao, bye-bye.